Good afternoon. Uh, I can say that because I uh, believe everybody's from North America on this session today. So uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining us for uh, the third in our series on well integrity logging systems. Uh, my name is Steve Weringa, for those of you that don't know me, based here in Calgary. And today uh, we're going to be sharing some information on magnetic flux leakage. Spartech uh, has a casing inspection tool. It's uh, referred to as a CIT. That is uh, our magnetic flux leakage tool. So we'll be going through the uh, concepts of the tool and then uh, get into some case studies. So uh, if you were able to join us for our last couple of sessions on well integrity, we did talk about uh, the life cycles of the well and, and well integrity as a whole. Uh, this is one more tool in that toolbox. Uh, so when we're looking at well bore integrity, uh, the primary function is to make sure that our, our assets are in a usable workable state during the completion and production stage of them. And then uh, when we get into decommissioning that they're in a, a state that we can safely put them to bed. When we're looking at uh, standards, uh, there are a couple primary international standards that are used uh, for casing inspection and integrity. Uh, those would be the, uh, the ISO 16530 uh, well integrity document, as well as the NORSOC uh, D10, and that is the post Macondo one. The, uh, here in Canada, there's, uh, there's local regulations as well. Um, direct, uh, the Alberta Energy Regulator, Directive 51 or Directive 20, uh, and most countries will have some sort of standard and uh, most oil producing or oil and gas producing companies uh, will also have uh, their internal standards for well integrity. So these are all things we need to keep in consideration when we're looking at well integrity data. Some of the events that uh, will likely trigger the requirement for logging for well integrity, particularly casing, is uh, new drills. Uh, we want to look at detection of casing ovality. Our last session was on the multi-arm finger caliper. Um, that's a, a very good tool for, for determining that. Uh, detection of deformation and uh, identification of downhole profiles. So if we've got uh, liners, uh, if we've lost track of, of sleeves, we're not quite sure things were placed where they should have been, uh, we can log those in place. Uh, looking at uh, internal corrosion of the tubulars, looking at external corrosion of those two same tubulars, uh, looking at the uh, condition of any sliding sleeves or downhole valves. And then as uh, the well progresses through its life stage, there are typically monitoring programs where you may be looking for scale or slow corrosion events. So we wanna make sure that we're capturing those and, and understanding the condition of our well bore. When we're looking specifically at casing inspection, uh, quite often we'll refer to the API specification 5CT. Uh, that's where we'll find a lot of the references for uh, pipe burst calculations and, and uh, operating strengths of our casings. So it's a very handy document to have on hand when we're looking at this type of data. When do we run casing inspections? Well, uh, pretty much throughout the life cycle of the well. So the beginning of the well design, uh, first of all, we want to make sure that the casing uh, that we're going to put in the well, the tubulars are of such that we can measure. So we know which tools uh, to program as the well progresses in life. Uh, some of the exotic metals or, or fiberglass uh, wells can be very difficult to manage. Some of the bigger, uh, bigger size casing or oddball casing, again, will these tools manage that? So that needs to be taken into consideration. When we're drilling, um, as we're setting different fluids, corrosives, uh, bit damage, drill pipe damage, uh, that kind of stuff comes into play. Completion, uh, fracking operations. Once we get into production and flowback, uh, we're going to have some corrosion monitoring programs uh, using corrosion mitigation technologies if we're doing chemical jobs or uh, coated tubings and whatnot. And then if we're looking, if we have actually done repairs, can we, can we repair? Um, manage those and, and make sure they're effective and are working. As the well declines in, in its life, uh, we may see different, or quite often we'll see different fluids. So those will add to our corrosion issues potentially. Uh, we may see a, a 
different medium of flow, may get higher sand cuts uh, for running uh, circulating pumps, may see tubing wear, all sorts of stuff can show up. And then at the end of the day, when we're looking to put those wells to bed during the decommissioning stage, we want to make sure that those well bores are in such a state that we can safely decommission them and uh, make sure that they don't pose a uh, environmental hazard during that uh, after they've been decommissioned. So really, uh, during the entire lifespan of a well, uh, engineers and, and production teams really do need to consider any of the operational factors and make sure we keep that corrosion at bay or minimize the threat uh, as best we can. Our friends at Tenera showed uh, shared some of these pictures with us a while back. These are just some uh, some examples of some of the extreme wear and erosion conditions we we see. Um, <clears throat> there's some uh, internal ringworm that can actually happen internal and external. And then uh, this is a two and seven eighths, uh, so not really within the realm of this tool, but um, the same thing happens with the larger casings. We can see that uh, internal wear and external uh, issues quite often will start to combine. So the uh, the MFL tool is a magnetic thickness tool. Uh, this is a high resolution uh, pad type design. Uh, it uh, encompasses magnetic uh, sensors, so it's uh, it's not a, a phase tool or a, magnetic pulse tool. Uh, this is measuring the magnetic field. It is a padded tool, so it is specific to casing sizes. Uh, there are th four uh, current designs, and uh, depending on how those tools are configured, we can log anywhere from four inch. Um, here we say nine, nine and five eighths, but we actually do have some kits that uh, are available right up to 10 and three quarter inch. Depending on the size of the tool will depend on the number of pads. So the pads are pretty much universal uh, in design. Uh, we just add more of them as the real estate of the tool increases. So it's, it's about the radial diameter and how many of those pads that we can get together. While we're running these tools, uh, quite often we'll run them with other uh, combined uh, sensor arrays. Uh, gamma ray typically for correlation purposes. Uh, there's high res temperature available in the tool or we can run additional sensors to capture that. The multi-arm or multi-finger calipers that we talked about on our last session and then the segmented bond tools all make up part of that uh, integrity package. So specifically the uh, the CIT tool is a uh, made up of rare earth magnets so it is not an electromagnetic tool it doesn't require a, a huge amount of power from surface so it can be run on pretty much any monoconductor line. Uh, within the tool, there's a special alloy backing bar that uh, is used to saturate the casing. So when we're looking at the tool here, we have a strong magnet here and a strong magnet here, backing bar through, and then that creates a magnetic field over top of our sensor array. Uh, and then depending on the size of tool, we could have anywhere from 8 to 16 pads per tool with 8 sensors per pad. Uh, the sensors are uh, very high resolution. So they're sampled at uh, 200 samples per second. So depending on the speed that you're going, uh, will change the resolution of the log. However, the tool's not speed dependent. So it can be slowed down or sped up. Uh, it's not like some of the older tech where uh, the coils were affected by uh, not having continuous logging speeds. Uh, that's not the case. You could actually sit still with this tool and capture the magnetic thickness, or you can run it upwards of 35 meters a minute or 120 feet per minute. Uh, to capture that information. Okay. Uh, there is a surface readout component to this tool, uh, although it's a hybrid tool, uh, so a lot of the information is, is stored down hole, and we'll talk about that when we get to the uh, acquisition section. Principal operation of it, again, the, uh, once we have all of those sensors uh, circumferentially around the tool, each one of those sensors will create a data point that data point is then combined and we're able to get a full map of the casing wall. Uh, the software will go through and uh, automatically pick collars once it's uh, processed and then uh, we'll give you a casing map of uh, 
what the uh, potential damages of the casing, as well as summary reports. And we'll go through all of those as we step through this. So here's uh, that section of the tool again, where we've got the magnets on both sides and the magnetic sensors in the middle. Uh, our aim is to uh, saturate the casing. So when we look at magnetic flux, it really is uh, very much like taking a cup of uh, a paper cup, fill it right full of water. When you squeeze that cup, the water comes out. Same idea when we're looking at casing. If we can saturate the casing with the magnetic force, once uh, we remove some of that mass, there's no longer room for all of that magnetism to stay within the pipe and thus it will leak out. And it's these pads that will actually detect the amount of leakage and, uh, and map the leakage circumferentially around the, the pipe. Well conditioning for these types of tools is very important. Uh, so bit and scraper runs, uh, if you got some wax or asphaltines, you may need to do some chemical treatments or circulations. Uh, but the tool will be affected adversely if, if we don't have uh, the contact that we need. So this chart here actually demonstrates, you know, if we have a, an 80% liftoff, our data is very poor quality. Um, you know, we get a very minor liftoff and all of a sudden it exponentially increases in, in sensitivity and, and reliability. So crucial that those uh, tubulars are cleaned up before these tools are, are deployed. All right, um, <clears throat> when we're looking at uh, the leakage, like I said, think that paper cup, we give it a squeeze and the magnet, uh, magnetic field is going to leak out of that casing. And then the pads will directly measure that leak off. Uh, we uh, apply that to modeling. So the amount of leak off we see, and from that we can detect and determine how uh, deep the corrosion is and potentially um, the uh, what it's looking like as far as uh, shape and, and uh, location. Now, uh, between internal and external, so on this particular one, this is all external. The other, uh, there are two other sensors in each pad and they are uh, standoff discriminators. So what they will do is they'll detect if uh, there is near or near pad proximity uh, of metal. If there is near pad proximity, then we can make the assumption that that uh, corrosion or that metal loss is to the outside of the pipe. Uh, if we're looking for even more uh, precise, a stool can be run in combination with a multi-finger caliper, which will give us a very good internal map of the casing as well. If we come into a, a case where the corrosion is internal, uh, the discriminators will not see that metal near, near pad. And then the, uh, the assumption can be made that that magnetism has uh, leaked or is leaking off and continues, but now that it's an internal leakage. <clears throat> so if we, uh, we have a complete hole, we're going to completely lose the magnetism and that's going to show up uh, as a complete loss. So if we look at this uh, here, obviously these are uh, perforations. And we can actually see the uh, the helix of the gun. So this would be a map of the entire well uh, split, spread open. So this is a full 360 degree. We see here on our curves, each uh, curve is picking those up and multiple curves will pick up each perforation depending on the size of those holes. And here we see our discriminators have lifted off a little bit. The discriminators are here and then we see our max penetrations. Once we have that data, uh, we can present it in a uh, 2D format or this three-dimensional format and start to get an idea of what those, uh, that damage actually looks like uh, with the mapping of the metal loss. So things that we'll be looking for, uh, things like pitting, uh, some collars, uh, general corrosion or any wall thinning uh, will be detectable by this tool. Now the interpretation and process that we use uh, allows us to take that data and apply it uh, to an algorithm. Uh, those algorithms are designed based on empirical uh, data history, uh, example pipes, uh, samples, and then uh, log history as well. So as the database grows for that particular size of pipe, the algorithm tends to get better and better. So very uh, 
it could be a very accurate tool when all the, uh, the right calibrations are applied to it. One of the uh, advantages of a, a multiple casing or a CI, CIT tool, tool ugh, good English, um, when we're looking at CIT tools, because we're dealing with magnetic flux leakage and not actually inducing a, a phased eddy current through the, uh, through the system or a phased magnetic pulse, uh, it tends to be rather impervious to secondary strings. So if we're looking at a, like an EMT tool, if we get into a second string, uh, there's going to be a significant amount of interference from that second string. Uh, with the CIT tool, we will see a, a change in magnetic thickness, which will uh, offset our baseline a bit, but the tool is able to compensate for that. And as such, we're able to get a, a very clear picture of magnetic thickness within multiple casing strings. And that can always be a challenge for some of the other tools. Each pad is uh, interchangeable. So if we do have problems with a pad or a pad wears out, uh, it can be individually changed out on the tool. Each pad goes through a calibration process. So in the lab, uh, we put it in a high temperature electromagnetic uh, field, and then we're able to control the amount of mag uh, magnetic field that we put through to that pad. And then the pad is calibrated to a, uh, to a Gauss meter in the lab. Uh, the temperature range of, of the calibration goes right up to 150 and from zero to 200 Gauss. Uh, so that makes sure that we're in the range that we're able to uh, see that leak off at, at any level. Once a tool is deployed to the field, uh, there will be a, a couple of calibrators that are used to make sure everything is uh, in good shape and everything's communicating and within Cal once we're in the field. So basically it'll be a, uh, for the discriminators, for the proximity detectors, we'll put a zero offset and a 100% offset. So basically uh, jig on, jig off to make sure that our uh, discriminators are functioning properly. And then there'll be an MFL, so the magnetic flux leakage uh, verification jig. And again, that's put over the sensor array so that we're able to see if, if all the pads are communicating properly prior to running it into the well bore. And this is done right in the field. As far as where we can run this tool, so these tools are rated to 150 degrees C or 300 F uh, for a maximum of four hours. Uh, obviously, if your temperature is lower than that, it'll go for quite a bit longer. But four hours is, uh, is usually long enough. Uh, the tool is uh, or does run at approximately 35 meters per minute. So you can get a lot of logging done in uh, four hours. Pressure ratings of the tools, uh, they're 15,000 PSI and uh, they're H2S resistant uh, as the, uh, the tool itself is made out of an ink canal compound. It has 100% radial coverage. So each pad you can see here is kind of overlapped, uh, just slightly offset so that each uh, sensor has a clear field. And then it, it samples at uh, 10 samples per inch uh, when you're logging at 35 meters per minute. Now you can slow down and you can increase that resolution if you need to. So depending on what the circumstances are. As far as uh, measurements, uh, zero to 20 percent, or sorry, 20 to 100 percent casing penetration is detectable by the tool. Uh, the uh, sensitivity, uh, so a quarter inch pit or hole or defect is, uh, we can see that at 10 percent penetration, or sorry, 20 percent penetration. And then the accuracy is about 15% uh, for isolated pit and 10% uh, repeatability. So very sensitive tool, um, very stable and uh, extremely high resolution. I'd mentioned earlier that uh, there is the option to run a multi-arm caliper if you uh, choose to get an even uh, tighter map of the internal. Do the fact that it's uh, reliant on good pad uh, contact. Uh, it does require special centralizers that Spartec has, uh, has developed for this tool. Uh, the typical uh, vertical wellbore environments or the, uh, the 375 to the 575 tools uh, will run with a forearm slip over centralizer. Uh, that will allow po positive centralization. When we're looking at uh, the bigger tools or high deviation, so if we're going into uh, high deviated slant or horizontal wells, 
and we will change up to the six arm uh, that will allow even better centralization and, and hold up the heavier tools. As far as uh, what the tool looks like when it's all put together, uh, I kind of alluded to the fact it's a, a hybrid tool. So it has both a surface readout control module that sends information up hole to the surface acquisition. Uh, then we've got a, a gamma ray section for correlation. And then there's a memory section. Uh, so the majority of the information that the tool gathers is actually stored down hole. And we'll uh, get into that here in a couple of slides. Then we put the, uh, the sensor array that is pipe dependent on the bottom and then a, a bottom CIT adapter with some other electronics. And then the ability to tag other tools below that if we need to. Once we uh, run it into a, uh, an in-hole configuration, we do uh, strengthen the uh, uh, telemetry in the gamma sections, and then the uh, slip over centralizers are placed immediately above and below the MFL sections to make sure that we have positive centralization. Hi, we, uh, any questions so far? Oh, excellent. Okay, so acquisition mode um, for these types of tools, uh, having the, uh, the baud rate required to punch this stuff up a monoconductor line is just not going to be there. So this is a hybrid tool, which means that uh, it does log in surface readout mode. Uh, however, the majority of the information is actually stored down hole. Now we can monitor that and make sure that it is actually capturing the data. That's the reason for the SRO. Make sure that uh, we've got points of interest. If we see anything, uh, we get just enough to, to give us an idea what's happening down hole and to monitor the tool's functionality. It does have four gigabytes of memory in it, so uh, it can store a lot of information. Uh, and that sampling rate is not limited by the wireline communication. So uh, even if you got really poor line, or even if you went with no line and went straight memory, uh, you could uh, you still capture at full rates. Uh, so this is kind of how the uh, the data splits off. So in the memory section, we're getting the full resolution MFL and uh, discriminator. Uh, we're also recording uh, the time and uh, some other memory data within the tool. And uh, if we have to uh, run it without communication, then it would have a, a programmable section as well. The surface readout requires a logging panel. Uh, this will uh, supply the tool with its power, which is a more conventional way to run it. And then it will capture the depth and tension and everything that's coming off the, the surface diagnostics. Uh, up whole, we will get a diagnostic monitor of both the MFL and the discriminators to make sure everybody's in good shape and get a basic understanding of what's happening down hole. So the panel at surface is a uh, Spartec SRO panel, so surface readout. And uh, it also we require a laptop, typically the laptop's dual purpose, it'll run both the SRO. And then uh, once the tool gets back to surface, uh, we hook it up through a high-speed USB connection and, and download the rest of the data to that tool. Once we run it through the SPARWORKS data processing software, it merges all that data together, uh, allows us to make our depth corrections, and then the first process will go through and do an automatic uh, casing collar uh, locator, and that will help us now break the well down joint by joint. So if we have to do a detailed analysis, uh, we can look uh, individually to each section or uh, just at points of interest, depending on, on what we're looking for. Once that's converted, it does uh, turn everything into uh, standard uh, curves on the log. So this is just the same curves in a waterfall effect. Uh, and then we'll color code each pad. So uh, we can see the different colors here. Each of these different colors represents a different pad and each pad will have uh, eight uh, magnetic flux curves as well as a couple of discriminator curves. So just, just a quick uh, on the workflow. So you would uh, merge the logging data with the depth file at surface, uh, load the original and destination run logs into the SPARWORKS software, uh, run the initial uh, identify and edit uh, the collar locations and pipe sections. Then we generate a post-process uh, curve data set. We normalize those curves. So apply it to the algorithms based on the, the size of pipe and the conditions that we're in. And then that will allow us to do a secondary identification and edit to final pit sizes, uh, percentage of penetration, any damage 
once that's done, we can create the 2D image. That data set is also available to be used for uh, doing other presentations such as uh, three-dimensional uh, plots or uh, full 360 uh, interactive imaging. And uh, through there, we also get our joint tallies uh, where we'll get a full report of the amount of dam uh, damage or, or anything of interest. <clears throat> the user interface is uh, pretty easy. It's uh, all very much a visual interface, so be able to go through that. Once you are um, got everything done, then you can actually zoom in on the individual points. So a little bit dark on this one, but you can see here we're looking at a, a set of perforations and that'll actually give us some dimensions and everything of, of those pits and damage. The modeling uh, uses a finite element based software, which uh, basically means uh, it is the data is applied to a, uh, a slope window based on the calibration of the tool and based on uh, modeling and uh, testing of the sensor for those sizes of casing. So the data is matched and that allows us with a, a very precise and high res uh, final product. Now, as far as what uh, does all this look like when we're done? Uh, when we're at surface uh, logging the tool, this is this is the data you get real time. So this is coming up whole. Um, what we see here, uh, we'll get some diagnostic curves. So cable had power, so we know that we're uh, powering the tool properly. Uh, accelerometer, so we can see if the tool is sticking, because even though our surface line speed might look nice and clean, if the tool has some sticking issues or uh, having trouble down hole, a yo-yoing effect. We can see that on the accelerometer right away and, and make line speed corrections if that's required or uh, know when to not get ourselves into trouble. Uh, correlation, uh, gamma ray and logging speeds will also be there so we can identify where we are in the hole real time. And then each pad uh, will send up a sample of the MFLs and a sample of the discriminator. So we can tell that each pad is working. And we can also see if there's some potential damage happening. So if we go back to this presentation here, this is over a set of perforations or several sets of perforations. You can actually see in the clean pipe above the perfs, uh, we've got fairly clean uh, lines. So that tells us those areas are probably not of interest. Then all of a sudden we get into our perfs and we can start to see that damage uh, and that potential interference on the magnetic flux. So we can go back. Uh, we may need to want to run repeat sections, uh, any points of interest that the uh, operator sees logging out of the hole, uh, he can make note of and then go back down and, and possibly pick, uh, get a repeat or even maybe slow the logging speed down and go for high res higher resolution. Once all that comes back to surface and we've merged everything together, uh, this is a typical layout of the, uh, the final product log. So on here, uh, we will have all of the magnetic flux leakage curves from each pad, so eight per pad. Uh, we're looking at uh, the discriminators. So these may be uh, displayed as uh, strictly max curves, or min max curves, or we can look at each individual discriminator. Uh, we'll also have the maximum uh, penetration and circumferal uh, penetration. And then as well as a baseline, the baseline uh, is set for the, uh, the expected size of pipe that we're in. So the tool is processed back to that. So if we do have slight changes in casing, again, each individual joint is, uh, is processed. And then the last uh, bit here, just for easy visualization, is the, uh, the MFL map. All right, so let's uh, take a quick peek at a case study. Oh, I see we do have a question. Uh, can you measure the entry hole of the perforation? Um, there is a, a degree of, of uh, uh, what the tool is able to measure, uh, depending on how big the casing is and how many sensors we have. So we're limited uh, in circumferal. Uh, as far as uh, vertical height, uh, that tends to be a little more sensitive if we slow the tool down. So yeah, we can get a good idea of it. Um, it's not going to be as precise. Uh, as having a piece of pipe at surface and, and actually measuring it physically, but uh, it should give us a fairly good indication of, of what we're dealing with. Uh, you'll see that in the uh, report coming up. I'm just gonna shut that window down for a minute. Okay, 
Dwayne, I hope that answered your question. Like I said, we'll show some examples of, of the reports that come out. Um, typically, you know, we might take a, a grand view of the, of the well at a one to 200 scale, but really the resolution uh, at that scale is, is gonna be very difficult to see small defects and stuff. So even though we may, uh, we'll have a one to 200 or one to 240 if we're here in North America uh, scale, Typically, what we're going to want to look at is either one to fifty or one to uh, one to twenty is is more typical. Uh, so here you can see the uh, the resolution of of those holes. So this is a, another perforation area. We can actually see where the uh, it was either a second gun or there was an uh, a blank section within there that the shots weren't fired or ineffectual uh, perfs. Uh, sorry, Dwayne. Uh, Dwayne is one of our. Uh, our uh, explosive suppliers. So we uh, we work quite closely with them on our QCT, but um, typically this is gonna tell you exactly where those holes are, uh, how deep uh, if they're limited penetration. And you can see that here on the, uh, on the maps. We'll also put a grading system on the log as well that will reference back to the uh, joint report. So when we're looking at the joint report, uh, several pieces of information here that are of, uh, of importance. Uh, first off, it gives us a tally, so we can actually uh, compare that to what they ran uh, on the initial completion. So it'll give you a start, uh, start depth for each of those joints. It'll give you a length of each of those joints. Uh, just for reference, we have the uh, factory min uh, OD and, and ID, just so a uh, point of reference. If that changes throughout the wellbore, uh, slightly different uh, weights uh, that may change. Uh, then we can apply a cl uh, class uh, color system. Uh, this is editable. So uh, if you have a specific uh, profile that you would like to see that can be uh, programmed or easily changed in the software. Uh, this one's kind of the uh, Canadian standard where we have 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100% penetration. So uh, gray to red. Then we'll have uh, our max penetration per joint. Uh, it will have that uh, pitting location will be there and the minimum wall thickness that we, uh, we see in those joints. We also see the, uh, the lengths of those uh, pittings or holes. Um, now, depending on the tool and depending on the casing size, uh, this one here, we've got a, a 10 millimeter uh, resolution. Uh, radially around the tools. So to Dwayne's question, uh, we're going to get a good idea, but we're still uh, between sensors. We're at about uh, half of that. So about a five millimeter, uh, give or take. The uh, pitting type is going to tell if it's, it's internal or external. That's based on the uh, discriminator prox uh, proximity sensors. And then uh, this field is also uh, customizable uh, to the client desires. Uh, it's a it's a uh, pressure failure calculation. This particular one uses the uh, Barlow Model B uh, 31G uh, modified, uh, but there's other uh, there's several options here. Uh, they typically are compliant with AP API 5 uh, CT parameters, or they can be actually defined uh, by the company itself. And that uh, those formulas can be plugged in. And then those numbers are automatically generated based on the formula. Okay. So here's just an example of uh, some of the 3D mapping uh, that we can see. Uh, so this is a two day or 3D surface plot. And uh, here's a standard log plot. We've already kind of looked at this one. You can see the the resolution, how tight uh, we can get there around the collars. And then we can also uh, do the uh, cylinder plot uh, using the 3D modeling to take a look at any of those defects that we see. Final products, uh, obviously data sets. So uh, logs are deliverable and then uh, full reporting. Now the uh, software, uh, is uh, we've got petrophysicists on staff that uh, will train this uh, the software with you. Uh, they're also there for support. That training and support can be done either in person or remotely, depending where you are. Uh, thanks to the age of COVID, we've got really good at, uh, at remote <laughs> training and remote uh, uh, support. So those are available. <clears throat> All right, I'll check just one more. We're still good for questions, excellent. 
Good. All right. Um, just a quick uh, go through the individual uh, modules just to kind of show you where they're they're able to be run. You know, these are the uh, numbers for kind of the out of the box tool without any uh, special kits to change the uh, configuration. So the uh, the factory settings issue would be for the uh, 375 tool. If you notice the uh, collapse uh, OD is actually the, the name of the tool. So the uh, 375 collapse is down to 375. Uh, it will log up to a 4.3 uh, ID. Uh, the five or four and a half inch tool will log up to 5.1. Uh, the five and three quarter will log up to 6.6. 6. And the 800 will log from eight inch up to uh, 9.2. Now this again is out of the box. These are the factory settings. We have special kits depending on the casing size that you're in that uh, the tools can be adjusted uh, to fit larger casings. For instance, the, uh, the MFL 800 actually has a kit that will take you right up to 10 and three quarter. And then just some of the, uh, the numbers. Uh, so you can see here, so for a seven inch casing, or sorry, a, uh, eight and five eighths casing, we actually have 176 sensors all the way around the tool. So we're, uh, when we add up all the uh, temperature and everything together, if we're looking at the MFLs, uh, we're covering that with 128 sensors. So uh, pretty high resolution compared to some of the other options out there. Are just some of the highlights. Uh, the tool is again, a uh, high resolution uh, due to it being a hybrid tool. So we're actually able to capture a lot of information without worrying about getting it up the line in a timely fashion. Uh, so we're about, uh, or not about, we are at 200 samples per second. It is insensitive to speed. So if you wanted to slow right down to a crawl or uh, speed right up to its maximum speed, that's uh, you can change those uh, speeds as you go. It's not going to affect uh, the outcome of the of the sensors. It's uh, repeatable and quantitative measurements. So it's uh, it's not based on changes of field. It is actually a true thickness uh, sensor. As far as uh, quantitative or, uh, assessment of tubulars, we can resolve pitting, gradual thinning, or internal or external corrosion. Uh, there's various deployment options, uh, standard single or multi-line conductor wires can be used. Uh, there are options, as I mentioned earlier, for both coil and, uh, and slick line. Uh, there are some special considerations to be uh, looked at here. Uh, battery power being uh, the primary focus of that. So definitely something you want to uh, work with your business, local business development manager to make sure we've covering all the bases and, and getting you to uh, the parameters that you need to successfully log your wells. Uh, proven field performance. This tool has been around for a while now. Uh, it's been deployed uh, several hundred wells globally. So it's, it's got a pretty good track record, uh, a decent database of, of logs. And then it uh, it is a combination logging tool. So it can be run uh, with other tools that are on the uh, Spartech Open architecture platform. I mentioned a couple of those already, uh, tools like the CIT or um, the uh, multi-arm caliper tools. All right, so short and sweet, um, kind of takes you through the, uh, the primer of how those tools work and, and how they're deployed and how they capture their data. So I'd like to uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. And uh, we appreciate again, your, your time. We know it's, it's of value and uh, we appreciate that you are willing to spend that with us on uh, going through these products. So hopefully this was uh, informative and of value to you. Uh, we're going to, uh, if you have any questions of today's uh, session, uh, the sales at spartechsystems.com will actually go to the uh, global business team and then uh, the appropriate member of that team will actually uh, follow up with you. So we do have uh, business development uh, members right across uh, the Americas, uh, Africa, Europe, uh, Middle East, and into Asia, so Asia Pacific. So we're well covered right across the globe. And like I say that, uh, that general sales at Spartech is monitored, and then the, uh, the calls are dis distributed to the appropriate area.